Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so many. Uh, I'm not Diana Damara, but he's Fred Plotkin. <laughs> uh, Ms. Damara just uh, called us. She's, uh, she's running a bit late. But since Fred is Italian in everything except for his sense of punctuality <laughs> and being on time, he wants to start anyway. So since the Metropolitan Opera just announced uh, the season for 2017-2018, uh, and Fred, I think, is the first journalist in, in the whole world to comment on the season. And he wrote a full piece for his blog uh, on WQXR that you can read, and I invite you to read with his observation on the season. We thought that we would uh, wait for uh, Madame uh, Damrau by talking to you a little bit about what to expect in the next season of the Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. And also, if you have any question for Fred about anything that has to do with Italian opera, should also open it to cuisine and uh, uh, visual arts and anything else you know, or just limit it to opera? Anything you need to know about Italy. OK. But we'll start, <laughs> Fred, we'll start with uh, the upcoming season. And as soon as uh, Mrs. Damara come in, of course, I'm going to leave her seat. And uh, uh, she's going to start the conversation with yep. Fred. Yep. But Fred, tell us something about. What to expect? What do you think are going to be the highlights? What do you think are the operas that we should not miss at the Met next year? Well, as someone who's absolutely crazy about Rossini, as you know, um, not to miss from any stretch of the imagination is Semiramide. Uh, it has not been around for many, many years. And it is his third to last opera. And his last one being William Tell, and the one before being Il Viaggio Rems. And and Le Comte de came in that time, but it's his last Italian language opera. And to me, it's his Italian language masterpiece. The music is glorious. It was done, the Met did it in 1992 as a special production because Rossini was born in 1792. So the Rossini Bicentennial was 1992. And of course, he was very special. So he was born on February 29th of 1792. So. He died very, very young at the age of 76. <laughs> but um, musically, it's extraordinary. It has a superb part for mezzo-soprano, which is sometimes sung by soprano. Um, and it will be uh, Angela Mead next year. Those of you who have come here a lot know that <clears throat> I try to spot talent before they get big. Now, Deanna Damaro is a big star, but I try every year to have someone who was just new and you don't know him or her yet. So when he was very new, I had Luca Pizzeroni, and now he's a big star. And I had Angela Mead when she was just starting out. And the next one of that type actually is next, the next session, March 14th, is Nadine Sierra. And if you don't know her, you want to know her. She's fantastic. But um, Marilyn Horn was in the original production with June Anderson and Benita Valente. And they had a young guy making his Met debut whose name was Samuel Ramey. <laughs> and it was one of the great debuts in Met history. And it's a wonderful production. Uh, the story is too long to tell. And complicated. And complicated, even more than Ipuritani, which I've been trying to figure out how to tell you about tonight, but I will. Um, Fred, uh, yes. talking about artists, artists um, that we are not going to reveal the calendar of adventures in Italian opera, even if Fred, of course, is already working on it. But shortly, we will make the uh, announcement of the lineup. I can assure you that it's a very, very impressive uh, list of names, even if few or no Italians so far. No. Uh, but artists that are Just going me. to appear at the Metropolitan uh, that you think are particularly interesting, that okay. either because it's their first appearance or because, or because of the promise they carry or because they what are I changing think, something in the way they perform? What I think is very notable for next season, and this is neither a criticism nor praise, but I think it's an interesting change. Clearly, the Met has decided for next season to focus on a group of young singers, mostly soprano, in their late 30s to early 40s, 
who represents sort of the next generation of future artists. And they are doing a lot of repertory with them. So people like Angela Mead, Sonia Yancheva, Pretty Yende, um, Nadine Sierra, Aileen Perez. These are names you may or may not know yet. You know some of them, of course. But I think it's an interesting move in that basically they're guaranteeing their future and not putting all of their emphasis just on one star, so to speak, but bringing along a group of younger artists. The limitation, and I wrote about this in an article I published today, is that by having mostly young sopranos, they sing only certain things. And so for that reason, we kind of have repertory that I call the girlfriend roles. <laughs> Sometimes the sick girlfriend roles, but these are the roles that you know well, Mimi and Violetta and so on. And some of them die, some of them don't. But the point is that there's a similarity, and that troubles me just a little bit, because although they're all wonderful singers, we want diversity in our opera. So um, a term I'm about to use is not my term, they're called the big girl roles. And this doesn't mean that you're heavy. What it means is you have a lot more emotional power. So a big girl role is Norma. And Sandra Radvanovsky will be doing Norma, then Marina Rebecca, and then Angela Mead. So you Norma completists like me will be going to three different performances. Um, the biggest girl role of all is not Brunhilde, it's not Isolde, it's Electra. And Christine Gerke, who sat here last year, um, is singing Electra. And to me, she's the best Electra in the world. So for that reason, too, that's, I remember the date. I put it in my calendar, March 1st of 2018. Um, Joyce Di Donato, who sat here, um, is doing two new productions next year. She will be doing Adalgisa in Norma. And then she will be doing Cendrillon which is Cinderella in the version by Jules Massenet. And thank you, Julian. We all know and love Julian, who just printed for me the new season, although I think I know it. But um, He seems to know it pretty much by heart, right? And they just published it, so. They just published it, but I studied it. Um, we do not, it's interesting. There we go. Ponzel, Milanov, Sutherland, Collis, and Radvanovsky is the great lineage of Norma. We have La Boheme, and... Is it a new production, or is it no, Zeffirelli? It's the, the Zeffirelli, which we know. That we love. And I'm going to go through these, actually. And Boheme is interesting because that's sort of the introductory role for all the girlfriend roles, so to speak. And there's an American artist who's a big deal in Europe, but we've not had her yet. Her name is Angel Blue. How's that for a name for a singer? An Angel Blue. Marlene Dietrich? Marlene Dietrich, the Blaue Engel. Um, and Sonia Yancheva will be in it, and Anita Hartig, who's another one of, the, she's Romanian, another one of these young sopranos. And there's a tenor who will be singing in uh, Bohem that I want to call to your attention. I'd like to get him one year. I didn't ask him for next year, but I do want to get him in the future. His name is Russell Thomas. Don't know if you know him. Um, he's a wonderful, dramatic tenor. He has a gorgeous voice. If you went to Nabucco this year, you heard him as Ismaeli, um, and he's terrific. Michael Fabiano was in that as well. Um, Marco Almeyato is conducting. And Fred, yes, to sir. interrupt your, your list, uh, a suggestion, because uh, you, you do a lot for people who love opera, you give us precious advice, but you also do a lot for people who know nothing about opera, and your, your book, Opera 101, remains one of the fundamental texts for anybody who is trying to uh, approach opera. Uh, a suggestion for some members of the other audience that want to invite a young friend or family member and introduce him or her to opera. Which opera should they take this person to uh, next year at the Metropolitan? Well, as it happens, I just turned to that page, Stephanie. You made it very easy. <laughs> Madama Butterfly. Um, Obviously, we did not rehearse this. We you know, did not, did, because this this is, is, I'm, I'm going through the pages as we speak. Yeah. Um, and Madama Butterfly, there are better first operas, although it's a very good one. But um, this opera has its flaws. People say to me, you know, why? did she not trust this guy? 
why did she enter into a marriage for 99 years, or maybe 999, I forget. Um, didn't she know he's an American sailor, and doesn't she know anything about American sailors? She's 15, and she sings so loud and so long. How can she do that? There are questions if you're being literal. But if How can she call her son Dolore? Yeah, pain or trouble. Um, but anyway, the reason I would commend that, there are two reasons. One is it's in November, so early in the season. Number two, it's a wonderful production by the late Anthony Minghella. And if you've never experienced this production, you want to go for that reason. And that is part of how I would get a new opera goer to go to that. Still with the puppets? Yes, one puppet. Um, if you've seen it, it's a Bunraku puppet. That's the little boy. I call him Woody. And um, I, at first, did not like this little puppet. I but hated the puppet. But I've grown to love it. Did you? I've grown to love it. I'll tell you why. I've known many women. We had Catherine Malfitano here a couple of times. Um, she, on her first performance, a new production of Butterfly at the Met, the child playing Trouble, it was a girl, fell and banged her head. And here Catherine Malfitano was trying to keep it together to play this incredibly hard role of, of Cho Cho San while worrying about this girl who may have had a concussion falling off a piece of scenery. So you don't have that with Woody. If he, bang <laughs> if he bangs his head, he's fine. But, but I, ca I cannot cry for Woody. I need a real child to cry. When I go to Butterfly, I want to cry. Well, actually, you remind me. <coughs> when I was 20, I lived in Bologna. And that was the very first time that I saw Madame Butterfly and at the Teatro Comunale. And what happened was, the whole audience of Italians, obviously, started crying in the second act. Now, the bad stuff, we don't see until the third act. And I couldn't figure out why, why are they crying now when all they're doing is putting flowers all over the stage? Because they knew what was coming. And that was an interesting lesson to me about Italian opera going. Very important, in fact, that they know the story. So part of what I try to do is, if I teach her, if I take someone to the opera, is not to tell him or her, in the next act, she's going to kill herself and her kid won't be watching or might be watching. <laughs> so I check how many intermissions there are, and I tell just enough story to get us to the intermission. And then I tell the next part of the story. Uh, I, as you know, I'm not <coughs> a big fan of projected titles because the composers told these stories in music primarily, and only secondarily the words were an inspiration. But um, we can hear the music. You can hear in the orchestra the moment when Butterfly realizes, bum, 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 that's his new wife? They've come to take my child to America? Really? Bum, 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 that's all you need. And suddenly, your heart, you feel the stab. If you're reading and it says, who is that woman, chi è quella donna, that's not good. You want to listen to the music and have that happen. So um, I'm going to talk about other operas that are coming. Another one that we don't see very often is, is Thais, T-H-A-I with an umlaut S, which someone once said to me, are you going to see thighs? <laughs> Where are the thighs? At the Met. The thighs are at the Met. It's Thais. And what she has to be... Thais. <laughs> Thais. And she says, Je suis belle et désirable. I'm beautiful and I'm desirable. And she is. And in this production that was created for Renee Fleming and Thomas Hampson in Chicago and then brought to New York, um, Rene Fleming was Belle in Desirable, and he desired her. That's the story of the opera, basically. So what it has is a lot of beautiful, intoxicating music. Um, you need two great singers, and this year we have Eileen Perez, who's wonderful. I didn't invite her for next season, but I want her to come in the future. She was not available. Um, but she's a marvelous artist. You do want to see her. And Gerald Finley, who is a superb baritone. He was William Tell this year in Guillaume Tell. And so for that reason, uh, worth hearing, because we don't hear that opera very often. And the gowns are terrific, because 
if she's going to be belly desidopla, she has to look good. So the costuming in this opera is great. Now, I'm not telling you a secret by telling you that the Met had planned a production of La Forza del Destino. And they canceled the production, some people say, because of cost, some people say because of the potential offense that it might give. I have not seen the production, so I don't know. But they have replaced it with four performances conducted by James Levine of Verdi's Requiem. And I, we have Crossamira, this is from memories. That is my favorite Verdi's opera. Yeah, he said, e la mia opera Anche preferita. Me. Opera meaning work, but also opera. Um, it's Crossamira Stoyanova is a soprano. I'm forgetting the meds, so I'm working from memory. Alexander Zantonenko and Ferruccio Furlanetto, who sat here. He was one of our first guests will be the quartet with the Met Chorus Orchestra and James Levine conducting. So Four performances of the Requiem. Four performances. Oh, yeah. The um, mezzo is Ekaterina Semenchuk. Had I known to turn the page, it's all in print rather than relying on memory. A um, lot of Mozart next year. They're doing Die Zauberflöte in German, and they're doing the Magic Flute in English. Um, <laughs> They are at different times. No Italian Mozart, no Da Ponte? We're getting there, we're getting there. But Die Zabelflut is early in the season and the Magic Flute is around the holiday period. They're doing a new production of Così Fan Tutte from 1790. Um, it's one of the three Da Pontes with Don Giovanni and Le Nozze di Figaro, which will be here in December. And one of the members of that cast has confirmed already and he'll be here December 7th. Um, Mark your calendar, important your guest. Calendars. December 7th is also St. Ambrose and that's the day in which La Scala opens its season. Yeah. So we're going to have a sort of a adventure with a party included to celebrate that fundamental day in the opera calendar year. Uh, and any question for Fred? Start thinking about it. We I think we have a few minutes for them. Actually, I'm good to go. You don't even have to ask me more questions. I can take over now and just tell you about the rest of the season. Unless you have questions, I'm always glad to answer. But um, the Magic Flute being done in English will have Nathan Gunn in his famous portrayal of Papageno, and a lot of people come just specifically to see Nathan Gunn. Uh, the Merry Widow. <laughs> Le Nozze di Figaro with a very good cast. Nadine, Sonia Yancheva, Nadine Sierra, Isabel Leonard, Luca Pizzeroni, Marius Kvichin, Ildar Abdrazakov, and Harry Bickett conducting. Just based on the cast, I would go. They're doing Hansel and Gretel, and I know that's not part of the Italian repertoire. Come si dice Hansel, Hans in Italiano? Hansel. Hansel und Margarita, e Margarita, Hansel and, and Gretel. And it has Dolores Zajic as their mother. Oh. And Dolores Zajic uh, was here. Um, it has a wonderful Irish mezzo named Tara Arat, who will come here to here in future seasons. Um, she's the big young mezzo Rossini um, bel canto star at the Munich Opera. But she's from Ireland, and I actually had the occasion to give her a lesson years ago. And uh, so it's a very, very Good cast with Lisette Oropesa as Gretel. Now, Fred, I'm yes. stopping you there. This is what it's in the season. What is not there? I'll get to that in a moment. I want to talk about what. <laughs> no, really, I do. Because the next thing I've come on to is the most talked about thing of the next season Tosca, a new production. All right, I know most of you did not care for the current production. What about hate it? I, for one, found things to like, like in that production. It was not perfect, but there was a lot to like in it. However, they're turning a page, um, and it opens on New Year's Eve, and it will have Christine Opelais in the first cast and a young woman named Anna Netrebko in the second cast. Second cast, Anna Netrebko. It'll have a tenor named Jonas Kaufmann. <laughs> All right, and Marcelo Alvarez will perform with Anna de Trebko. It will have a baritone who one day I would love to get here. I talked to him about it, and we'll see if we can do that. Named Bryn Terville. Magnificent. 
and George Gagnitza will be the other baritone, and Andres Nelson conducts. What do we know about this production? This production is by David McVicker. If you saw the three uh, queens, yep. he did all of them, and he's doing the Norma. So I know you asked me what is not coming. Um, Obviously, what is not coming that you would like well, to see in there? Well, the point is, a lot good is coming, so I don't want to uh, leave that out. I do want to point out that Maria Agresto, who you met here last season, mm -hmm. will be starring in two productions next season. That's what I mean about their concentration on these young sopranos. And I think that is the news um, of next season. What is not coming is anything written before 1786. Because Lenozzi di Figaro, we tend to talk about the period of opera of the standard repertory. 1786, Lenozzi di Figaro, 1924, Puccini's Turandot. Now, there's a lot of great opera after 1924. We get to see more of it, and I'm very happy for that because we need to see more of it. But there's a whole lot of great opera from before 1786. Opera was born, as you know, in Florence in 1597. And the first great composer of opera was Claudio Monteverdi, who was from um, Cremona. He could not interest the Florentines in his ideas, so he went north to Stefano's hometown of Mantova, Mantua. We would like to think that opera actually was born in Mantova. Well, the first good opera was performed in Mantua. Good, thank you. And that's L'Orfeo <laughs> from 1607. But then he was drafted to Venice and wrote many, many great masterpieces. I hope a lot of you went to the Serenissima Festival that just concluded at Carnegie Hall, at Juilliard, places around town. Here included. Did. We hosted four re Venice-related events. And by the way, tomorrow evening at 6, we're going to have a performance, performance, stage performance of Goldoni's memoir. As you know, uh -huh. Goldoni is the great author of Italian uh, plays, most of them in Venetian. Yeah. Uh, but, and he also he wrote an autobiography in French, of all things. And uh, we are going to provide the stage version. It's, a, it's an engaging and fun piece that is rarely seen on stage. Uh, in Italy, the most important uh, staging of the memoir uh, was done by Streller, with whom Fred worked. So we have a brand new production. Tomorrow is going to be the premiere. You're all invited. It's a free event. It's going to be here at 6 tomorrow, if you're interested. And that's our last contribution to La Serenissima Festival uh, from Carnegie Hall. Which has been wonderful. Uh, one thing you don't know about me and Goldoni, Stefano. Uh, Streller didn't believe me until I showed it to him, and it turned out to be true. When I was working in Milan and studying with Streller, I lived in Pavia, which is just south, in a college called the Collegio Ghislieri. And I was in room 12. And each room had a plaque outside with the names of the illustrious students who lived in that room. And the two most famous who lived in room 12 were Carlo Godoni and Alessandro Volta, who created and defined voltage for us. So we wouldn't have the lights here tonight if we're not for Volta. Um, but anyway, I think that the composer who we most need to see more of, apart from Monteverdi, who this year, had he lived, would have been 450 years old, um, is Handel, George Frederick Handel. Because people often say to me, but the theaters that we have, like the Met, are too big for Handel. I don't agree. Um, when you look at the productions the Met has done of Handel, they've tended to have big singers. And I don't mean physically large, but I mean with a lot of presence, a lot of charisma, the ability to get the voice out. So we're talking about people like Marilyn Horn, who starred in the first Handel in 1984, Ronaldo, Samuel Ramey, um, and also, um, I'm suddenly at a loss for who else. Uh, later, Susan Graham, Renee Fleming, David Daniels, all of these artists who really are fantastic Handelians. So it's not a matter of the stage is too big. It's that the imagination is too small. And if a good production is done so that we focus on the singers, we had Danielle Denise here a couple of years ago. She played Cleopatra in Giulio Cesare, at Julius Caesar. And these artists are all outstanding in these roles. So we can do that. And the Met Orchestra is the best opera orchestra in the world. So they can do that. 
and Harry Bickett, who is conducting Le Noce next year, um, is a superb Handelian, and every year he comes to Carnegie Hall and he conducts a Handel opera. Uh, Joyce Di Donato, who was here, superb Handel singer. So all of this is possible, but it's just, I think, and I'm not saying just the Met, all the big opera houses have an absence of imagination if they can't realize that there's a place in our repertory for Handel. And when people say to me, well, um, he's only performed in small theaters, the answer that I give to that is the following. The Queen's Theatre in London, where 25 of his operas had their premieres, has 1,200 seats. The Teatro La Fenice in Venice has 700. And La Fenice saw the premieres of Ernani, Simone Bocanegra, Rigoletto, and La Traviata. Those are works that are done in big opera houses. So if you can do those works that premiered in a place of 700 seats, you can do Handel works that premiered in a place of 1,200. So that is my concept of what's missing. Questions for Fred? I'm going to bring the mic. Back there. Where, 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 where? La Fenice what? 100 seats? No, it doesn't. When it was opened, it was 700 seats. It's been rebuilt. There have been a couple of fires. Maya, is the microphone if anybody has other questions? About the upcoming season or any other curiosity? Anything about opera. Anything about Italy. I didn't, because I want to go on other topics. I'm holding Louisa Miller. I feel like one of those magicians who you say the opera and I'm holding it. Um, there are 26 productions next year. Louisa Miller is a wonderful one. It has Piotr Bechava, who was here last season, and Sonia Yancheva and James Levine <laughs> conducting. It is another one of those Verdi operas that, from 1849, so he was, <laughs> He was just about to start his famous trio of Rigoletto, Trovatore, and Trovatore is coming next season, and Traviata. And um, this is one of those operas based on a play by Schiller. And I forget whether she takes poison from a ring, from a glass, from a thimble, something. But she takes a bit of poison, and she dies. Um, Sondrion, which is the next one I'm looking at, no one dies. This is Cinderella, um, and it has Stephanie Blythe, and it has Alice Kuh, the wonderful mezzo, and Joyce T. Donato. So what's distinct about it, the three leading roles are sung by mezzo sopranos. Um, how many of you saw Diana Damro this year as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet? They're bringing that production back next year, and it will star Aileen Perez, who is also playing Thais, and Briani Mel, do you know him? He's a wonderful, dramatic American tenor, or American dramatic tenor. And he's from Louisiana, so his French pronunciation is better than mine. And um, there are many treasures. One thing that I left out, actually, was a new opera by Thomas Addis, A-D-E with an accent S, who was a British composer. And he did an opera a few years ago called the... Um, the Tempest, based on Shakespeare, and it will have a huge cast, and the new opera is called The Exterminating Angel. How many of you love your cinema, Louis Bunuel? It's a famous film by Louis Bunuel that's been adapted. It has a huge cast, and so I can't, I can read them all, but I'm not going to. But um, it's very interesting because people say we can't have new opera, that there's nothing <laughs> valid in modern times, and, and I profoundly disagree. When people ask me why there are no good new operas, I always say, well, there are good new operas. Um, people say, well, there were better Once Upon a Time, and I would say, we only know the masterpieces from Once Upon a Time. All those operas that didn't succeed have been forgotten or put on a trash heap. Um, but failing that, we always have good new operas. I'm going to Washington next week for two modern American operas at the Kennedy Center, Dead Man Walking and Champion. And so I always encourage you to be open to new works. Um, another 
production that's coming back, I don't love the production, but I adore the operas, is Cavalla di Rusticana and Pagliacci. Is it a new production or the old one? It's the old dark. With the rotating with the table? With a turntable. And Mama Lucia has the biggest table in all of history in her trattoria. Thank Luciana you. Damrau. Thank you very much.